Welcome to Parker's MMA Show. If you want to learn about all things going down in the fight world, you've come to the right place. Each episode, your host, Parker Keene, will take a deeper dive into the always entertaining world of sanctioned fist fighting. Now here's your host, Parker Keene. We're live. What's up? We made it. What's up, dude? How are you? <laughs> I'm worn, worn out. How are you? I'm good, man. Some good skiing in Colorado this weekend. That was pretty fun. What, did you shoot down there for a couple of days? Yeah, man. My uh, my buddy from high school actually got engaged on the mountain, so we uh, we went down and uh, hung out for a couple of days. Where were you at? Durango, Colorado. Huh. It's like Where near the New Mexico of Denver border. Or something? Oh, yeah. Eh, kind of far, yeah. So good trip, no injuries, came back in one piece? No injuries, man, came back one piece, all good, so uh, yeah. good to go, man. Let's talk about some fights. Let's do it, let's do it. So so a couple things we're going to talk about this week. We had uh, Bellator 238 went down, what is it, two weekends ago or is that last weekend? Uh, that was, uh, two weekends ago now, man. Yeah, we so had we're, a week off of MMA. Yeah, we're, we're a week behind here. We're slacking. But anyway, we're going to dive into Bellator 238. The same weekend you had UFC Raleigh, um, North Carolina. And then this weekend we've got the return of the light heavyweight goat, pound for pound, number one fighter in the world, John Jones. So let's get into it. You want to start with Bellator? Let's do it, man. Let's talk about it. The Cyborg Show. Yeah. Man, she looked fucking good, huh? So here's my thing, Parker. And I know I came out last episode and kind of talked about how I think Cyborg really needed to use her wrestling and that Julia Budd was this great striker. And I was so impressed by Chris Cyborg just coming out and putting on these Mortal Kombat combos in the cage, just beating her up, you know, throwing, you know, 10, 15 punches in a row with, with no repercussions at all. Um, I mean, she really broke Julia Budd, um, you know, in those third and fourth rounds. I thought that was one of her most impressive performances to date. Yeah, it kind of looked a little bit to me like, I mean, Julia Budd, once she got in there, just realized she was in there with Cyborg and kind of shit the bed a little bit. It looked like at the end of the fight, and she said it in her, you know, post post-fight interviews that, you know, she was just super, super disappointed with herself. And I, I think Cyborg is one of those people, you know, like getting in the cage with Fedor or John Jones. They just have this aura about them. Um, and I, I just didn't really see Julia Budd show up. I, you know, I saw Cyborg look really good in a fight that, you know, she needed to make a huge debut in Bellator and and really make a comeback after that, you know, getting finished by Amanda Nunes. But... um yeah, that's kind of what I thought. I, I thought she looked great all around. Yeah, and I actually, I'm continually impressed with the way Bellator kind of differentiates themselves. And so I absolutely loved Cyborg walking out in the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar jersey, Lakers colors in that crazy robe, mm -hmm. came off as a huge star, and then just comes out and puts it on this woman. Like a woman who had really dominated the 145-pound division for Bellator and Cyborg comes in and is saying, this is my belt now. This mm -hmm. is my division now. All you guys are chasing me. She's got this contract where it it uh, incentivizes her to just go undefeated. That's like a huge incentive bonus of her going six, eight, ten fights in a row undefeated. And for her to just come on and take out her, her number one challenger, other than Amanda Nunez in the world, in my opinion, and do it in such emphatic fashion i mean how could you not be impressed well and what do you think about bellator I mean, that's like the best probably the best result they could have hoped for i mean cyborg's a star and i think the ufc never was really able to capitalize on her stardom and how you know famous she is and i, I think that's a big win for bellator well it's funny that you bring up fedor because that's what it reminds me of it's like she she seems unbeatable she you know, there's there's going to be, I think, a time where Bellator is going to have to kind of like force some matchups and mm -hmm. uh, really throw some women in there with Cyborg just to get beat up, mm -hmm. to be honest. But um, 
you know, the mystique just felt so, so real. I mean, and you're talking about now you have the her fourth belt, right? So she's got UFC, Invicta, Strike right. Force, and Bellator. Right. I mean, most accomplished female fighter of all time. Um, you know, I think Nunez beating her still retains the GOAT status, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, Cyborg's got the most hardware. Yeah, I mean, that... <clears throat> The only thing I I want to see from Cyborg is her fight Amanda Nunes again. <laughs> Nothing else in Bellator is going to excite me right now. Um, and I think Amanda, right. Amanda uh, Nunes is in the same boat. I mean, like, who's she going to fight next? Uh, uh, <laughs> I have no idea, man. I think uh, I think Irene Blenko is probably next for Cyborg. She's fought Julia Budd twice and lost. Um, and I just think they're going to do like a 145 pound Grand Prix, try and get some, uh, try and get some talent out of there, and see if they can really actually build a 145 pound division. Well, I think and, there's more yeah. girls there than we realize. Yeah, and I mean that keeps Cyborg busy. I mean that's going to make Cyborg fight three or four times this year, and I think that's great for Bellator. So, yeah, overall, I mean I thought Cyborg looked incredible. Um, I was really surprised with their paydays. Did you see see the paydays on that? So I wonder, that's the disclosed purse, right? So I wonder if there's some sort of incentive or handshake deal in the back because, like, there's absolutely no way Julia Budd's walking away with more money than Cyborg for that fight. I, I wouldn't there's think just so no either. And then what that shocked me. Those numbers, I wouldn't think Julia Budd would command two hundred fifty thousand or three hundred fifty thousand dollars a fight. So maybe Cyborg did get some sort of bonus or, like you say, win. You know, whatever. Um, she would have to, I would think, because what? What do you think she was making in the UFC? Maybe double that. I mean, it has has to be six figures. Like you know, I would think she would be like in the quarter million dollar range for every fight yeah. for her disclosed purse. Yeah. Um, you know, I think at the top end of it too, Bellator is paying these guys as much, if not more, than the UFC. It's it's really the depth you're talking about where the UFC sets itself apart. Where the UFC will have eight hundred thousand dollar fighters, and Bellator might have one or two. Yeah. Um, but I I I don't know. I think it's probably I I think she's probably making a lot more from sponsors um than she is from her actual disclosed purse. To be honest. Yeah. No, I, I liked her whole look, everything about it. She looked like the old cyborg. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I thought that was it was good to see Cyborg back. She's definitely got a little more left in the tank. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they do over there at Bellator with her. But, you know, I think she's got probably four or five good years left, I would think. Yeah, certainly. I hope so. Um, yeah. You know, I I enjoy watching her fight. She's got a fan friendly style, and I'm excited to see what gets thrown at her. All right, so Adam Borks in DC. We I think we both had Adam Borks as the dark horse, didn't we? So I told you that I I liked Borks as a dark horse, but I had I had Caldwell winning this in an ugly decision, and I I kind of went on a rant about how boring he was as a fighter, and he really proved me wrong, man, because he came out there. <laughs> took took Borix down, took the back, choked mm-hmm. him out, and and just took care of business very cleanly. I mean, definitely the best performance I've seen out of Caldwell to date. Yeah, I mean it. It was a short fight. What it was over in a minute or something. He just, I mean, absolutely yeah, sliced like right through. Ninety seconds. Him. Yeah, um, yeah, that was surprising. You know, I thought Borix would put up more of a fight. Um, you know, when I was watching it live, I kind of thought that maybe the bright lights got to him a little bit. He just seemed like he wasn't ready to go when that bell rang. And, you know, DC just walked right through him. And uh, that sets up, I I agree with you. I think that's going to set up one of the most interesting fights that Bellator can make right now. Yeah, I think that uh, Darian Caldwell against AJ McKee is actually the most intriguing fight Bellator can make right now. Because it's two homegrown guys. So mm-hmm. it's two Bellator guys. They both have really good resumes. They have great pedigrees with, uh, obviously, AJ coming from having a father in the UFC and mm-hmm. uh, Caldwell coming from being an All-American wrestler. And 
uh, contrasting styles. Like AJ McKee is a striker, Caldwell's a wrestler. Um, I, I just want to see it. I, I think that's about as exciting as it gets in in one forty five, which is a very exciting division. Like now, now mean, that's going to be the semifinal. Are, are even... That's the semifinal okay, of yeah. their Grand Prix. Um, you know, if those two guys are in the UFC, Parker, where where do you think they rank? Because I, I would have both those guys in the top 15. Well, I mean, you look at DC, 145s, I mean, really has no wrestlers, right? Yeah, I mean, I think at, you at could say, moment, like, Volkanovski is a wrestler. Frankie yeah. Edgar. Um, yeah, but, you but, know, Fra- Frankie's going yeah. down. So, yeah, I mean... I think with his wrestling ability, he would be able to slide in the top five. Is he on a Volkanovski or Max Holloway, you know, Korean zombie level right now? I don't know. Um, you know, from what I've seen with AJ McKee is, you know, he he's one of those guys. He's just super explosive. I, I think he could fit in anywhere. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I would say with cer- certainty, they're probably top five fighters in the UFC right now. Right behind that Max yeah, Holloway, Alex Volkanovski tier, really. AJ McKee, too. I mean, don't forget, he finished his last fight by triangle armbar. I mean, this guy can grapple, too. He's not just a striker. Mm-hmm. I think he's one of the most intriguing prospects in the sport, if not the most intriguing. So I really can't wait for that fight. So when, when does that go down? Is that that's going to be later in the spring? Maybe early so, summer? I think it's going to be in the summer because in March they're going to do the other two quarterfinals at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to make the Mohegan Sun trip again. I did that last year. <clears throat> that, that was a little rough. <laughs> hey, man, that's my home state. So, yeah, uh, maybe got I, a lot of love for Mohegan Sun. You have to show me around Connecticut a little more next time. Um, <laughs> yeah, but no, I. I, I thought Borks was going to put up a little better of a fight. I was a little disappointed. I think he he probably felt the same way. He just didn't get a chance to get started. He, you know, the fight started. He got taken down and then just steamrolled through. So, yeah, that was a little disappointing. Um, where do you where do you think Adam Borks goes from here? Well, I think, and this leads nicely into into the next fight we're going to talk about, but. Um, I, I'd like to see Borks against Henry, Cor- Henry Corrales. I mm-hmm. think that's a, a nice little matchup there at 145 for, for Bellator. And, you know, one of those guys will get back on track and, uh, and go from there. So does Henry Corrales and the Spaniard, they just kind of sit around until this tournament's over or how does that work? That would be my guess. Um, you know, the only, the only thing I think I could see is like, I could see Archuleta taking on, um, you know, say like the loser of Caldwell against AJ McKee or right. something like that. Um, but I think they they pause a little bit. I, you know, I'm I'm interested in seeing Juan Archuleta go down to 35. I, I think he's actually a little small for 45. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. It looks like Bellator is going to do a 135 pound Grand Prix and. I would love to see Archuleta in that tournament, so maybe some time off here wouldn't wouldn't hurt him. Right. All right, let's move on. We had um, who else was on that card? Um, well, Aaron Pico making a gigantic return. I mean, he he nearly killed that guy. Yeah, with a f- forearm, a left hook forearm that I mean, just fucking flattened that guy. Um. Um, yeah, that was, I mean, looks fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously it looks like the, the move to Jackson wink paid off. Um, to me, he just looked like he fought a smarter fight. You know, he didn't rush the knockout. He worked in the boxing. He had a big takedown in the first round. Um, he just seemed sharper everywhere. So I, I think that was a really, really good win to get his confidence back. You saw at the end of that fight, it looked like a gigantic weight was lifted off of him. He looked so relieved to get back in the win column. And I think that's going to be really important for Bellator, you know, to keep bringing him along. Not too crazy. I don't want to see him fight Juan Archuleta or Adam Borex or someone like that. Let's give him another fight or two, build him up, get his confidence back, and then go from there. 
Yeah, I agree with you. I think um, this was the appropriate level of competition for him. It's a guy who has a similar number of fights, and I just think Pico is so good at both boxing and wrestling. It's so hard for him to get these fights, and so I, I hope Bellator can keep kind of bringing him along and start to to work his confidence back up a bit so he can really get where he belongs, which I still believe is the elite of the 145-pound division. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I think you let this tournament play out, get him one more fight, and then, you know, end of the year, early 2020, that's when you start feeding him these, you know, higher guys and see, you know, how he, how he fares in that. But I mean, from a guy that's had the kind of rocky start he had to his career, you know, really, really big highs and really, really low lows, I think it's great that he's in a camp like Jackson Wink. He's, you know, there with John Jones, people like that that have done it. Holly Holm, and um, you know, I think that's a perfect fit for him. So I'm going to be really interested to see how they handle Aaron Pico and and how he responds in the next couple fights. But yeah, he that was a, the perfect result for him. I I couldn't look for a better you know return fight for him. Alrighty, so Juan Arch, Juan Archuleta gets a unanimous decision win over Henry Corrales. Um, I thought this was a close fight. I thought this could have went either way. I wouldn't have been mad either way. Um, what did you think? I agree with you. I uh, I think this was a, a fight that is a good argument for we should have more draws in MMA because I think it was honestly hard to pick a winner. I thought Archuleta landed more shots. I thought Corrales landed the better shots. Um, I, I was a little disappointed in Juan Archuleta, to be honest. I, I thought he... Uh, I thought he would have performed a little better than this. I, I don't think Henry Corrales is the elite of the 145ers in Bellator, to be honest. And I think to kind of eke out a close decision like like Archuleta did, I, I just expected more um, from a guy with his record and his skill set. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, ultimately he gets the win. And, you know, again, I, I'd like to see him drop to 35. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd like to see the Corrales against Borix fight. Just because I, I think that's a banger. I think that's a real brawl between two strikers. Yeah, and, so and I, think, I think it's a fan-friendly yeah. fight. No, I agree. I think Borks is going to be coming back hungry, too. You could see how disappointed he was in that you know 90-second loss to DC. So, yeah, I'm down with that. Um, for me, I mean, I, I think Corrales could have taken that fight if he would have just pulled the trigger a little bit. I mean, it was very, very even. And he just seemed very hesitant to pull the trigger, which is understandable. Juan Archuleta is a dangerous guy, but yeah, that, that's how I saw it. I, I agree with you. I wouldn't have been mad if that was a draw, but um, overall, I, I thought that was a decent fight. Um, you know, and then we had Raymond Daniels doing some spinning shit. What do you think about that? It's so entertaining, Parker. Yeah, it's I can't get enough Raymond Daniels. Um, I uh I would like to see him get one more maybe against a guy who's had like between 7 and 10 fights. Get get him in there against someone who's got a little bit more experience and then if Raymond Daniels is still clowning on a guy who's a little bit more veteran. I know you will love this. I know you want this and I'm finally on board. Give me Raymond Daniels against Michael Venom Page. I love that. I love that. Um yeah, that'd be my dream matchup. Either I want to see him, him MVP and uh, Wonder Boy Thompson have a Grand Prix between the three of them. <laughs> oh boy! Now, now we're getting crazy. Now we're getting wild. Um, no, that, that was. I mean, it's just like MVP. It's must watch TV. I don't care where he's at on the card. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna tune in. That was awesome, and I've. I've been trying to spread the Raymond Daniels word. I've been sending his highlights to everyone and, you know, tell him to check in and, and make it happen. The guy's 38 years old, too. It's unbelievable. It's so unbelievable. It, it's like, it is like watching a, the karate kid fight in an MMA cage, like in real life, where there's another <clears throat> man trying to kill him. That guy, the guy he is fighting, the poor guy, him and his wife both fought on the card, but... He just he looked so lost and just had no answers. He got hit with some of that crazy shit and just like staring at Raymond Daniels like, "What the fuck do I do?" <laughs> it was so wild. 
Didn't he try? He tried to like shoot a single leg, I think, at one point. Like there was a point where he tried to actually grapple, and Raymond Daniels like basically said, "Get off me!" and then spinning kicked him in the stomach. It was so like, crazy. It was wild. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that. That was very awesome. Um, yeah. So overall, oh Sergio Pettis, I want to talk about Sergio Pettis. Um, man, did he make a statement? He came out trying to kill people. So of the Bellator free agent signing, mm-hmm. in my opinion, this was the best debut for a Bellator free agent signing since Scott Coker took over the promotion. Yeah, no, that I think they struck gold there with Sergio Pettis. Like we, we talked about last uh, two weeks ago, you know, I, I think he was kind of stuck in the UFC. You know, he was kind of lingering around the you know top five or whatever, but he was kind of stuck in the shadow shadows of his brother. And I think now over in Bellator, he's going to be able to spread his wings and, you know, really start establishing a name for himself. I mean, he's the guy's got, I think he's got 19 pro wins and he's what, 25 or 26. So he's been at it for a long time. Let's not forget this guy beat Joe Benavidez. Mm. Like this is a very clear top five flyweight in the world. Who's now not cutting weight. Um, I think 135 is actually shaping up to be one of Bellator's better divisions. I mean, we're seeing all the talent they have down there now as these guys start to fight more. I mean, that title is vacant. I, I, I don't see... I don't see... I would be totally happy with having Sergio Pettis fight for that vacant title. I really want to see that Grand Prix. I want to see them get the rising guys involved and go to Japan. But ultimately, like, I think Sergio Pettis has all the makings of someone who could be champ in Bellator. Well, I think he could be a big star over there too. You know, and I, I think with the departure of Rory, that he's someone that could step in and be a, a big star in Bellator that can headline cards if he can become champ. And no, I I was really really happy for Sergio Pettis. I, I think he looked really good um, and just vicious. He looked. I've never seen him fight that aggressive and vicious. I mean, he was trying to fucking kill that guy. And rocked him and then took him to the ground and just, you know, finished him quickly. So, yeah, good for Sergio Pettis. That was that was awesome. Um, what do you think of the Nick D- Nick and Nate Diaz prodigy, AJ Asgram? I, I think I could beat I that guy know, in a boxing match. He has zero striking. It's terrible. Like, how, how are you that bad at striking? I have no idea. I, I like honestly, like he keeps his chin up. It's it's bad. It, it it's I don't know. I I watched his first fight and I was immediately like I went from all the way in to all the way out on AJ Aga's arm. I I'm just not. You know, I wish him the best. I I I love the Diaz brothers, so I want him to do well. But at the end of the day, I I just think there's a long way to go. Yeah, I think the gap is just too big for him at the moment. I mean, it's it's not good. His striking is terrible, terrible. He got rocked. He did he got he did the Kevin Lee stanky leg and then was able to kind of survive and get that guy to the ground, but he was rocked bad in that fight. And his his striking is just, man, it's like amateur. But he is nasty on the ground. If he can get you to the ground, you're probably going to get finished. But yeah, I don't, yeah I don't. it's very good jujitsu wrestling, but <clears throat> it was I mean, cool. the it was, striking is it was is cool seeing Nick good. in the corner. Nick was in the corner for that. Yeah, it's always cool <clears throat> seeing Nick yeah. and Nate out at these things. I think they had Chris Avila on the card too, who's one of their guys. Right. Um, so I, I'm excited. I think they. I would love. I've advocated for years that those two should just go over to Bellator. I think Nick, especially, was at his best when when Scott Coker had him in Strike Force. I think those are the best days of Nick Diaz. Well, that, he was at the top of the world, you know. Then he was probably one of the best fighters in the world, you know, at the height of his Strike Force run. So yeah, I I don't know. Is he locked up under contract with the UFC? Oh, gotta be, gotta be. Yeah. There's no way Dana's letting the Diaz brothers out from under the UFC contract. Yeah, I mean, I know Nate is, but Nick, I, you know, Nick would be someone too that could go over to Bellator right away and have big fights. Can you imagine oh, Nick, yeah. Nick Diaz and MVP? How about Nick Diaz and Paul Daly too? Oh, I love that too. Best first round in uh, MMA history, right there. 
Um, <clears throat> all right, it. so that was overall. I mean, I thought it was a pretty good Bellator card. Um, let's move on. UFC Raleigh. Um, you know, not a great card. It was really the the main event. You had JDS taking on Curtis Blades, and then the co-main event we had RDA taking on My- Michael Chiesa at that was at welterweight. Um, <clears throat> so JDS Curtis Blades. Um, I thought it. I mean, it really proved a lot for Curtis Blades. He he wasn't able to get his takedown. He was able to hang in there, and his striking looked awesome. Um, you know, and he was able to get JDS out of there in the second round by faking a shot and hitting him with a vicious, I think it was an overhand right, um, and then was just calm, cool, collected, and got the finish. What did you think of that one? Yeah. I uh, So Curtis Blades, obviously, known for his wrestling, Division One wrestler, um, one of these guys who takes you down <clears throat> and, and kind of uh, progresses to mount and pounds your face. And, right. um, and then JDS, I mean, I know we're not talking about prime JDS anymore, and he's probably a little chinny, and he's probably a little less less quick, less snappy than he used to be. Mm-hmm. But this was a guy who in his prime was considered one of the best boxers in the UFC, and Curtis Blades outboxed him. Yeah. He flat out outboxed him in this fight. I thought it showed great evolution. Um, you know, this is a this is a team now, a team elevation in Denver. I mean, you're talking about Justin Gaethje, Curtis Blades, Alistair Overeem. Um, Thug Rose. Isn't you know, this there? is a really... Who? Thug Rose. Isn't she there? Thug Rose. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're talking about a really, really talented group of individuals from a gym that doesn't get talked about the way the AKAs and the Jackson Winks and the ATTs get talk, talked about. Um, Anthony Smith is there, too. Yeah. But... They really got a stable of guys who is that are Mark really Mon- good. Is that Mark and, Montoya or Trevor Whitman? Uh, I think it's it's both of them, right? Are they together? So Trevor Whitman's a striking coach, and then Montoya's a head coach. Yeah, I believe yeah. that's how it worked. Yeah. No, I mean he to me he solidified himself as a top three heavyweight right now. But I think unfortunately he's he's going to be left out in the cold. Because you've got Rosenstruck and Francis fighting, and then you really don't know what's going on with DC and Stipe right now. Yeah, I think uh, I think you you could book Blades a couple of ways. Actually, I think you could go Blades against the winner of Lewis and Latifi, mm-hmm. or I think you could go Blades against Alexander Volkov, and I think both of those are compelling fights and. Uh, would would really solidify him as the number one contender after the winner of uh, Jarzinho and Francis. Yeah, where where was he ranked coming in there? He had to be in the top five, right? I believe he was four. Oh, what do the rankings mean anymore? So you got Stipe, Stipe the champ, DC number two, Francis three. You got Curtis Blades four, and then Rosenstruck. Overeem, JDS, Derek Lewis, Volkov. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the only two that are left would be either Derek Lewis, Latifi, or Volkov. Yeah, everyone else is, you know, would be a, a pretty big step back. So, yeah, I mean, I, I thought he looked fucking incredible. I was really, really I think that's the best we've ever yeah. seen him. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he's really only day, lost to problem- Francis, right? He's got the two losses to Francis. That's the problem, though. Yeah. He's lost twice to Francis. Yeah. In convincing fashion. It was bad. I mean, that fight in Beijing was bad. Mm -hmm. It was a bad, bad knockout from Curtis Blade. I remember watching that at like five in the morning, I think. (laughs) It's like a 10 second knockout or something stupid. Um, All right. So, yeah, let's move on. Um, Another guy that looked awesome. um, Michael Chiesa just keeps winning. And I think. Looked awesome. Yeah, this is a guy. I mean, 170 is where he needs to be. I, I just, I don't he know how massive. he, yeah, I, he, he was by far the bigger man in the cage. And I just don't know how he ever made 155. I'll never get it. I don't understand it at all either, but, um, you know, he looked huge in there. He, we've now seen RDA lose three times to really good wrestler, grappler type fighters. Um, I think we've kind of found the 
the game plan for how to beat RDA, mm -hmm. and Michael Chiesa followed it to a T and really dominated. I mean, pillar to post really dominated. Like, certainly RDA had, had his moments, but there was never a time where I thought Chiesa was in trouble and he was in control for the vast majority of that fight. Yeah, I mean, he, he put on a dominant performance. And I think he's starting to come into his own at 170. And he's going to be a guy, I mean, he's a problem. He really is. And I, I what did you think of the call out? I, I really like that call out. I don't think he's going to get it. But, you know, he got on the mic, made short work of the call out, just said, Colby Covington, I'm coming for you. I loved it. I think it's perfect. I think Michael Chiesa is not just coming into his own as a fighter, but really as a personality. I mean, this is a guy who's a humongous, humongous fan of this sport. He watches everything. He pays attention. He knows how the game works. And now that he's starting to really string wins together, uh -huh. especially at what seems to be his natural weight class, um, I think sky's the limit for that guy in terms of, of who he can get. I, I love the Colby call out. Um, the only other guy I would really like to see him fight is Wonder Boy. Mm -hmm. um, and if it can't be Colby or Wonder Boy, the, the two guys I wrote down that would be interesting are Jeff Neal, because mm -hmm. I think he's way underrated and way underranked, and uh, Robbie Lawler for mm -hmm. the, the legend factor and come in take down Robbie Lawler, beat him up on the ground, and call it a day. I think those would be uh, some nice fights for Kiesa. But if I was the UFC, like I'd be really pushing the Kiesa against Colby thing. I think it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, you know, Colby, Colby was on the aerial show today and definitely does not have a broken jaw. I don't know where that all came from. No. I... I... I I'm kind of sick of the Colby excuses. I think that like, was that was fake news. The, <laughs> the whole gimmick thing, the, his whole gimmick doesn't work that great when we just watched him get stopped by Kamaru Usman. Yeah. Like when he's beating everybody, it works. When he's not, it's like not as endearing in my opinion. Yeah, I like um I like the Damian Maya fight. I think that would be an awesome fight. He's booked, I think he's booked for that Brazil card in March. But um, Gilbert, he's fighting Gilbert Burns, yeah. which is I can't wait. I'm really excited for that fight. I think it's a really great battle between two jujitsu guys. But yeah, and I, um, I don't, I don't think Damian Maya yeah. has a lot, a lot more. He might retire in Brazil. Yeah, I think it's done for him. Against, I think, I think, uh, yeah, the Gilbert Burns fight is is his last one. That would be my guess. Yeah, but I, I'm looking at the rankings here um, for welterweight. You got Wonder Boys at 12, Robbie Lawler's at 11. And then you had GSs at nine. So, yeah, I, I think either one of those fights, you know, I'd be down with. Robbie Lawler's on a three-fight losing streak. Um, Wonder Boy just came off that war with Luke. So, yeah, I'm down with that. Um, all right, so overall, I mean, that card, not a lot. But those those two main events were or the main and the co-main event were pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to pour a cocktail, and then let's dive into John Jones. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. All right, so this weekend, going down in the Toyota Center, Houston, Texas, we've got the return of the GOAT, John Jones. Um, what, what do you think overall of the card? Um, so I, I think this is a pretty weak card. Um, I, I'm just not, I'm not too jazzed about a lot of the matchups. I, I probably see about, you know, three or four fights I'm really interested in. I think the UFC's schedule makes it so difficult to stack these pay-per-views and stack these cards at this point that it's almost hard to blame them. But um, I really think we're moving towards the boxing model where it's like you're you're looking at, you know, a, a good fight at the top of the card, maybe one other fight, and, and that's kind of how they're going to sell these to us to keep up with you know, putting on 40 plus events a year. How, how do you have Juan Adams versus Justin Taffa ahead of Derek Lewis and Ear, Alir Latifi? Derek Lewis, a hometown Houston native. Is that just because he's opening the main card? They want a big bang to open the main card or how does that work? Yeah, I, I actually like that because I think that middle fight on the pay-per-view, um, the right. swing bout should actually be the weakest fight on the pay-per-view okay. because anyone who's watching okay. that's already in 
you you want a strong main and co-main to put on the poster, and then you want a strong opener so that people have to tune in for the start of the pay-per-view. Um, and then those two middle fights are usually the weaker ones. But uh, I, I I don't I'm I'm baffled that for a pay-per-view that was scheduled, that's the absolute best fight that they could get. Juan Adams against Justin Taffa. Well, to be fair, this is, Sugar Sean was supposed to be on this card, right? Well, and I think I uh, I... Jimmy Rivera against Cheeto Vera was also supposed to be on this card. Right, but that's kind of a hardcore fight. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I agree. Overall, the card's not great, but you've got two of the best fighters in the world, and John Jones and Valentina Shevchenko. So, I mean, it's going to be a showcase to have those two at the top. So, um, all right. So, let's start with John Jones. John Jones making his 11th title de- light heavyweight title defense, taking on 12-0 and Dom Reyes. Um, initial thoughts on the fight overall, and then we'll get through. I want to go over kind of what you think the best path to victory for be- both guys are. Sure. So, um, legacy-wise, I think John Jones ties Mighty Mouse with this victory for most title defenses. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's e- easily the greatest of all time at light heavyweight and probably the pound-for-pound pound greatest of all time. Uh, I think the only real arguments at this point would be like a GSP who avenged his only loss and won two belts or a Fedor who fought a bunch of juiced up heavyweights in the most savage rule set ever conceived in martial arts. Um, yeah, I, I think John is, is actually way past mighty mouse in terms of actual skills and there's a lot of people who would probably disagree with me, and I see them on my Twitter timeline all the time of people right. who don't think John is all that great, and I couldn't disagree more. I, th- I think the guy is uh, as complete a martial artist as you'll ever see. Well, I mean, just look at his resume. I mean, I, I get the Mighty Mouse you know, comparison. Skill for skill, you know, I think those two are probably – two of the most talented to do it. Uh, Mighty Mouse is just never, ever going to win that argument with his competition that he faced, you know, down at Flyway. But, I mean, I'll, I'll go through John Jones. John Jones has... but Maybe John Jones and Cowboy are tied for the, probably the best two resumes in MMA. I mean, they are just stupid. The, the, the people John Jones had to fight on his, you know, reign of terror at light heavyweight and his rise... They're just crazy. I'll I'll read them off here. So we'll start. Which one did he win the title? Start start with start with the Stefan Bonner fight and then go down the list. Okay, so Ste- Stefan Bonner, the fighter that really put the UFC saved the UFC with his fight <laughs> against Forrest Griffin, um, finishes him. Okay, Matt Hamill. That was a fight he beat the living shit out of him. That should not be a loss on his record. Um, yep. Brandon Vera, who's the one heavyweight champion now? Yep. Or light heavyweight? Heavyweight. Heavyweight. Um, finished him. So we got Brandon Vera. We got uh, Ryan Bader after that, who's a two-division champion at Bellator. Submitted him. Um, Shogun Hua. That's when he legend. won the light heavyweight title. Absolute Since legend. Then, <laughs> the, these are his title defenses. Rampage Jackson in his prime, 2011. Legend. Then Leota Mochita, legend. Was Rashard a killer Evans. at the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Rashard Evans, champion, former champion. Uh, Vitor Belfort, Chael Sonnen, Alexander Gustafson, twice. Glover Tixera, DC, twice. Oven St. Pru. And then he break. you know, the new crop comes on. You've got Anthony Smith. Then he takes out Tiago Santos. I mean... Who who has a better resume than John Jones? Period. Here's the other thing too. You have Chael Sonnen and Vitor Belfort on every supplement, legal and illegal, under the sun, and John Jones still beat him. You have Glover Teixeira, who is on a twenty fight win streak, and John Jones still beat him. And you have Alexander Gustafson the first time when John mm-hmm. is admittedly going through drug and alcohol benders the week of the fight and still beat him. And, 
and barely trained for that fight. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah it, and, and I mean, he really, he's ran through three different eras of light heavyweight, just legends. And now he's on this new wave of up and comers. And I just, I don't see where I'm at on this fight. You know, I, I understand Dominic Reyes is a dangerous guy. He's an athletic guy. It's not anything John hasn't seen before. Okay, let me, I'm going to stop you right there. Because I thought you were going to okay. say that. Everybody's been saying okay. this. I want to break it down for you. Here's how Dominic Reyes wins this fight. Okay, tell me, tell me how Dominic Reyes beats John Jones. Let's go. Dominic Reyes is the best boxer that John Jones has fought in the octagon. His boxing footwork and his uppercuts are better than anyone John has fought. If you watch the way that he is able to hit guys with power punches and then either get out of the way or use his jab to create distance, it's unbelievable Like what he's done with really fundamental boxing technique that is really rare in the UFC. So that's one. Number two, he's long and he's able to keep people at distance in a really effective way. Even when he's pressed up against the cage, he finds a way to escape and he plays a really good matador and a really good counter puncher, even when he's moving backwards. So if he forces John to bring the fight to him or somehow entices John to like really come forward, I think Dominic Reyes can do some really interesting things, especially with his boxing and then mixing in some leg kicks and some body kicks Mm -hmm. to eventually set up a head kick to finish John Jones. Not saying it's going to happen, but there is a path to victory for Reyes. I just don't see it. I I get the leg kick things. We saw that with Tiago Santos. I've never seen John. That was the closest fight I've ever seen John have, even the Gustafson one. And that was fighting a guy on two bum knees. Um, So obviously that worked. But I mean, my thing, I yes, Dominic Reyes has a great, you know, jump jump out of the way to the left and counter with the left. You know, when he's backed up against the cage, you saw him knock out Weidman. Um, he hurt Jared Cannonier, I think, with the same technique with an uppercut. Um, man, I, I don't know. I just don't... I think it all revolves around John. It's what what John shows up. Is, is this going to be the full package, you know, destroyer that we saw just run through all those legends? Or is this going to be the John Jones we saw the last two fights that... I don't, I'm not saying... I, I think he's fighting more conservative... And I've heard him compared to like a you know later in his career GSP, and that makes a lot of sense to me. He's not taking the risk he used to do. You know, he opened up his first title fight against Shogun, running across the cage with a flying knee. You would not see John Jones do that, you know, recently. So I I just don't think there's anything. A, that Re- Reyes brings to the table that he hasn't seen before. He's seen the length. He's seen Gustafson. He's seen boxers. Man, I, I just don't see any path to victory. I think this is all about John. This is if John wants to stretch the fight out and not go in for the kill, I, I think that's the only way Reyes is going to hang around. I mean, John will dominate him on the ground, and I think if Reyes can't do something in the first round that it's just going to – He's going to pick him apart. I think John is just better everywhere, and he's going to download whatever Reyes brings in the first round and just pick him apart systematically and break him. That, that's what I see. So a couple things here. Number one, I think with, uh, with John Jones in terms of motivation, in terms of what John is going to show up, all those narratives, I think we saw in his interview with Ariel Helwani, his interview on SportsCenter, his – tweets and conversations about Dominic Reyes, this guy gets under his skin and motivates him in a way that Santos and Smith and Gustafson just didn't. They just didn't motivate him like this. Like It seems like every word out of Dom Reyes' mouth annoys the ever-living shit out of John Jones for some reason, and I think he's really going to punish this guy when they get in the cage. The other thing I want to highlight here is Dom Reyes might have the worst takedown defense of John Jones's opponents since OSP. 
I, like I think yeah, but, John, but with John, with John recently, he doesn't. He's not using his wrestling, and I think he's. He just feels like he's so good and untouchable that he wants to beat you at what you're best at. I mean, he took down DC multiple times, who is an Olympic caliber wrestler. If, he took if down. He, he, he took to go, down Gustafson, though. He took down Gustafson. Who? John oh, Jones on the sec yeah, in the second fight, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess I'm just basing it off the last two fights. It's been I felt like the last two fights John could have finished both of those fights. I feel like the old John would have finished both of those fights. I just didn't see that killer that wants to go in there and and just hurt you and finish fights. I saw a a more mature, just maybe a a more conservative version of of that. I mean, the skills are all still there. Everything's still there. I just didn't see that killer instinct like he used to have. And I, I don't know if he's he's fighting more conservatively or that's just how he was feeling that night. I don't know. But for sure, I think he could have finished Anthony Smith and for sure Tiago Santos, who was hobbling around on two bum knees after the first round. I, I think he's going to take Reyes down at points in this fight, and I think he's really going to try and hurt him with elbows. I think it's going to get really, yeah. really brutal, and it's going to get stopped and it's going to be tough to watch. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, like I say, John has the ability. I think John could take him down in the first round and just control him and beat the fuck out of him, cut him up, make it dirty. I, I don't know. I, I just don't see any path to victory for Reyes. I think John's just too good everywhere. I mean, he's he's the Floyd Mayweather of MMA. I so mean, give me your prediction, fight, Parker. I don't know. John is so weird. He's so weird. He could come in there if he wanted to and finish the fight in the first round. He could take him down and cut him up, or he could let him hang around and just pick him apart and kind of point fight him. I, I don't know with John. I, John is one of those people you can never get a read on. Make a pick. Make a pick. I, okay. I do, have, I do have the feeling that, like you said, I think there's some bad blood with these guys in the buildup. Um, and I... I think John's going to go for the finish because what this fight is going to set up. This fight, to me, if he goes in, makes a huge statement, and just steamrolls through Reyes, he's got the heavyweight options, and he's got a light heavyweight title defense against Izzy. That That's kind of what I see next. So I'm going to go second round, ground and pound finish John Jones. I'm going to go third round, ground and pound finish John Jones, elbow to the face, TKO. And I'm going to call my shot and say that John Jones fights at heavyweight in 2020 against Brock Lesnar. I heard rumblings of that too. God damn it. That just throws a whole fucking wrinkle into heavyweight, doesn't it? I love it though, because then... Stipe and DC fight in the summer. DC retires right. either way. If if you you get the winner against Francis and Rosenstruck fights probably Stipe or Curtis Blades for the title. And then you have John fight Brock, get his payday, beat Brock Lesnar, fight for the heavyweight strap. It it's just sets up for more big fights. I mean, I, I think that's awesome. Like I'm totally down to watch Brock Lesnar and John Jones fight. You know if DC beats Stipe, he's not going away. He's hanging around for those fights. I don't think he can do it anymore, to be honest. Like, I think his body's <sighs> kind of given up on him. He's, a, he's like, what, a year and a half past what he said he was going to fight to? And he's still got another trilogy fight with Stipe. And you know if John goes up to heavyweight, he's going to start fucking with DC and talk him into a third fight. Ugh. I just don't want to see it. Daniel Cormier's too good a guy to like go out on his like face first like that. I think he's too competitive and I don't I don't think he can get away from John. I think it's if John goes up gets one win at heavyweight, you're going to see the DC rumbling start coming up. So only, okay, only so, if they're so after you... Brock Lesnar. I I want to see Brock Lesnar and John Jones fight so badly and I don't know why. Take all my money for that freak show. I'm so in. I mean, but John versus Francis is just as big of a freak show. And if Francis goes in there and starches Rosenstruck, 
in 30 seconds. What do you think would be a bigger fight, him versus Brock or him versus Francis? John Jones versus Brock Lesnar is, I think, the biggest fight the UFC could make right now. Bigger than the McGregor rematch. Bigger than like not as Nate big Diaz. as that's not as big as that's not as big as McGregor and Khabib. There's no way. Oh, John Jones against Brock Lesnar. I no I, take all of my money. Take all of it. <sighs> Stop it. Boy, is Brock like fifty? I don't care. Have you seen him? Someone call Jeff Nowitzki right now. <laughs> he is on all the steroids. He's not going to be able to pass fucking USADA. I'll pay $200 for that fight if they let him do it in Japan with no steroid test. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, so you're, that was going to be one of my next questions. So with the win, you see John going to heavyweight, not fighting Israel right now. No, I think Israel's going to fight Yoel, which is a very, very difficult fight. And then right. I think he's going to fight Paulo Costa if he wins. I also think Yoel fights Paulo Costa if he wins. And... uh and then Izzy will go up to light heavyweight after that when he has what I think should technically count as three title defenses. Okay. You think Izzy's going to go to heavyweight? Uh, I think Izzy will fight John Jones at any weight. I don't think Izzy actually yeah. cares about getting a second belt. I think Izzy cares about beating John Jones. Yeah, I think it's a John Jones. He's not chasing Stipe up at heavyweight. I, I, I heard him say that, and that kind of threw me for a loop. but. I mean, they're both, I think they're built closer to what people, closer to each other than what people think. John may have 15 pounds on him or whatever, but that fight's going to happen somewhere. And I, I guarantee you that's going to be in the new Raiders Stadium 2021. John Jones versus Izzy. Just make sure you keep them safe for the Brock Lesnar fight, because that's a real money fight. <sighs> I don't want to see that freak show. Jesus. All right. <laughs> So, yeah, both of us have John Jones. I, I think it's going to be a dominant John Jones performance. Um, like I said, he, he can win either way. He can win the conservative way. I would like to see him win the old John Jones smashing the legends way. That's what I want to see. I, I think That's that what we just, all want to see. Yeah, I mean, John Jones, I think he could become a gigantic star in this new ESPN model. And if he comes in here and just busts the fuck out of Dominic Reyes um, and gets on the mic and calls out Brock Lesnar, I think the world's going to go fucking crazy. I hope so, man. That would be awesome. I'd love to see that. Oh, oh my God. All right. Um, co-main event. We got Valentina Shevchenko taking on Caitlin. I cannot say the last name. Chukagian? Chukagian. 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 That's a New Yorker thing, huh? Just call her Bond right, Fighter. Um, man, I'm I'm pretty much in the same boat as the main event for this fight. I, I just think Valentina's too good everywhere. And I think this is a big, big ask for Caitlin, the blonde fighter. Um uh, I see it the same way. I, I just don't see a way to victory. I think um best women fighters in the world right now, you've got Amanda, then you've got Valentina, and then maybe Cyborg right under there. Um these other girls just are not on that level. Yeah, I uh, I think Vaughn Fighter here has got to come in. She's got to blitz uh, Valentina. She's got to get her up against the fence, take her down, and really start to work the Henzo Gracie jiu-jitsu. Um, mm -hmm. she's, she's a good grappler, and she's a really awesome. I think she's a brown striker. belt, right? She's a brown belt, yeah. But she's a, mm -hmm. she's a good grappler. I mean, she like... She does impressive stuff for, for someone who's only a brown belt. Um, I, I, think, I think she's really got to make this an ugly, ugly fight. And I think Valentina can kind of sit back and just wait and pick her spot and, mm -hmm. and do some, like, really... I think she could do some real damage if Caitlyn makes a mistake on the feet. Yeah, I mean, you've seen what she's capable of with that vicious head kick last year. It was that Jessica I. Um, technically, as far as a technical striker, I think she's one of the best in the UFC. She's just so crisp, and her striking is on another level. Um, so, prediction, what do you got? I'm going to take Valentina by decision. I think, uh, yeah. you know, Chukagian's in the Henzo Gracie school. She she trains under Danaher. She's got people like GSP and Gary Tonin and Gordon Ryan and all those guys around all the time. So. I feel like she has a really good team, and 
she's trained hard for this and will make some some smart decisions. But I just think Valentina is is really in her prime, and until she slows down, I don't know that there's anyone in this division who can beat her. Um, and yeah. I think it sets up for the the Shevchenko Nunez rematch really nicely at 135. I do too. I, I think Shevchenko is going to win a dominant decision here, and I think that's the only fight to make next. That's a gigantic fight, and both of them are going to be without a dance partner, really. You know, so I, I think you make that straight away. Maybe put that on that international fight week with uh, George Masvidal and um, Usman. You know, that that could be on the main card. Um, yeah, that I agree. So we're in the same boat there. Um, Black Beast is fighting. H-Town, Houston's own, the Black Beast. One of my favorite fighters, best Instagram in the game, uh, Black Beast. Yeah, he In his last fight against that Russian that got stabbed in the chest multiple times, uh, Blagoy Ivanov, he, I thought he looked as in his best shape as I've ever seen him. He looked like he actually is starting to train like a professional fighter. He was coming off, you know, I think he had ACL surgery that he just had like a torn ACL for like four years and just never took care of it. Um, but he looked in really good shape. I mean, he was able to go all three rounds in a very, very tough fight. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what the black beast can do. I, I think he's one of those guys that he's always going to be in the hunt for a title shot, just because he's just got that freak knockout power that it only takes one. He can switch the lights off at any point in the fight. And then, um, what do you, what do you think of Ilir Latifi moving up from light heavyweight? Um, so I was reading about this, and apparently Latifi's body just couldn't handle the cut anymore. I guess he walks around at around two thirty five, two forty. So it's kind of amazing to me. I mean, the guy's built like a a fire hydrant, right? He's like five ten or five eleven, two forty, like just mm -hmm. super thick. Um. I just don't I don't see how Latifi beats Derek Lewis. Like is Alir no. Latifi going to go out there and try and take Derek Lewis down? Like I don't see Alir Latifi being able to hold him down or submit Derek Lewis and I kind of think that's the only way he beats him. I think if this fight stays on the feet, I think Lewis is going to put his lights out. Yeah, and I mean it takes one slip up. You saw it in, you know, that the Volkov fight where Volkov is dominating the whole fight last minute Derek Lewis catches him and puts him away um it can come at any time and like I say this is the most in shape I've ever seen Derek Lewis um so I'm gonna go Derek Lewis second round knockout I got the same Derek Lewis second okay. round knockout all right so overall um not a stellar card but like I said you've got two of the best fighters in the world at the moment fighting it's for me, it's it's must watch TV, and anytime Derek Lewis fights, it's must watch TV. He's gonna get I got on the one mic, more. say something crazy. Okay, I got, got one more guy for you to watch too. Uh, yeah. early, early prelims, so fire fire up your ESPN Plus or your Fight Pass or whatever it's on. But Miles yeah. Johns, uh, mm -hmm. Dallas guy, Fortis MMA, undefeated, one on the Contender Series, former champion in LFA. Um, Guy is really, really talented. Um, he's good everywhere. He's fast, 135-er. Um, this is his UFC debut, and I think this is really a guy to watch. I think Fortis has shown they can churn out guys that are really talented at, at all levels of the game, and uh, I, I think Miles Johns is, is really going to put on a show in his debut. All right. All right, so UFC Houston going down this weekend. Everyone tune in. Um, Let's knock out a couple of these current events. Sure. Take 10 or 15 to minutes to run through the current events. Um, so let me see. I don't know if we talked about this last week, but what was your take on the whole Stephen A, Joe Rogan back and forth? So the only thing I really have a problem with that Stephen A said is that Cowboy is a quitter. Um, yeah. I, I think that was wrong and he never addressed it. And you know, for a guy who's putting his health on the line for our entertainment, which every single MMA fighter does, I think that's a pretty bad thing to say when you could say that in hockey, you could say that in baseball, you could say that in basketball. Fighting's a little bit different in that respect. Um, 
But I tend to agree with Steven that I don't think we learned a lot about Conor McGregor in that fight. I, I thought he just kind of blew the doors off Cowboy. And, like, I'm as happy as anyone that he's back and he's in the win column. But I don't disagree with that. And the other thing is, I think Joe Rogan is a little holier than now about the MMA thing and should be looking to just educate Steven and, and helping him understand better rather than saying, you know, MMA is not in your wheelhouse. And that doesn't make it right what he said, but at the end of the day, he's going to put more eyeballs on your sport. And I think you should be a little more forgiving and a little less of a gatekeeper in, in getting people involved in the sport. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I was upset with the whole cowboy quit thing. I mean, Stephen H. Smith clearly didn't do his research or whoever does his research for him to, to realize who cowboy is. Cowboy's got the most wins, most head kicks, most, I mean, most everything. He's a legend in the sport. And to come in there and say he quit, I thought that was ridiculous. A, um, B, I mean, the UFC and, and, and ESPN, there's better people to have on the broadcast than Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith can be at the booth with Chael or Ariel after the event if they want to get eyes and use his name. He does not need to be ringside with Joe Rogan after the fight, breaking down the technicalities of a fight. I mean, you've got DC, you've got Felder, you've got Dominic Cruz, people like that that could do that job. And no one gives a shit. Like, what did Stephen A. Smith add to that broadcast or little segment Here's with Joe Rogan? Here's my question, Parker. Stephen A. Smith has a television show and a radio show, and they almost never talk about MMA. So yeah. why don't you slap some MMA segments on first take and on the Stephen A. Smith show, number one. Yeah, and number right two, yeah. Number two, you have his partner, Max Kellerman, has been a boxing commentator for two decades now. Why don't we get right, Max right. Kellerman at some UFC events, someone who really understands the fight game, and have him do some commentary because he would be fantastic at it. Yeah. How bad did the MMA community turn on Stephen A. Smith? Oh, my God. <laughs> M- MMA they're, fans they're not, are the They're worst. so ruthless. They're so we ruthless. are brutal. Oh, my God. Well, yeah, this shit just doesn't fly like it does in football or basketball. You can go out and say, oh, LeBron quit. He gave up on the game tonight. But you can't go out and say... Cowboy Cerrone quit. He's a quitter. I mean, that's just stupid. And that, yeah, like I said, I, I was upset that the UFC and ESPN would even let, put Stephen A in that spot. You know he's a moron that's just going to shout out something crazy to get a reaction. And then he doubles down on it like a total asshole. Anyway, all right, so we're good there. Um, let's see. Heavyweight situation we kind of talked about. I think you're you're going to know a lot more after John fights. Yeah, definitely. And and we need to wait yeah. for Francis to fight Rosenstreich, too. I think everyone's kind of anointed Francis, the uncrowned king. And, uh, you know, rightfully so. I don't think it's undeserving. But at the same time, he's fighting a guy who just knocked Alistair Overeem out. So, um, you know, I, I think he's got to get by Jarzinho Rosenstreich before we well, he's fighting crown him a- with yeah, anything. Yeah, he's... He's fighting a guy that basically followed his same path to the top. You know, he he knocked out Overeem, he knocked out um, Orlowski. You know, so that that's a good fight. I think that's a great matchup. That's a fucking banger. I'm really excited for that fight. But I do think you're going to get a little movement with John this weekend. I if he blows the doors off of Dom Reyes, I'm going to be really interested to see what he thinks because to me, there's nothing really left for him at light heavyweight unless Israel comes up and makes a giant light heavyweight fight. But I don't think he is going to care to fight the Corey Andersons of the world or Jan Blakovich or any of those guys. I think he's going to either go heavyweight or go chase that fight with Israel. Um, so that, that's kind of where we're at with, with the heavyweight situation. Uh, apparently Stipe was cleared from that eye injury, but he's just not rushing back to book a fight. Yeah, and that's a that's a tricky situation, right? Because obviously, you know, it's his eye. It's not like it's a finger or a toe or something like that, or you know, even even something that uh, you know wouldn't really affect him outside of fighting. I mean, 
you want Stipe to be able to see when he's in old age. But, uh, you know, I w- I would, I'm a Stipe fan. I've been a fan for a while and would like to see him get back in there simply because I think people still underestimate him. Um, and I think he's, he's clearly the best heavyweight in UFC history. And, um, I want to see him continue to fight. I want to see him con- to continue to break records and, uh, I, I just hope he can he can get healthy and he can return to the cage. I, I think he's playing a little bit of mind games with DC as well. Could I be possible. DC kind of yeah, DC kind of drug him along with the whole Brock Lesnar possibility fight, and that never happened. And you know, I think I think Stipe is kind of getting his revenge a little bit here, and DC is getting older and older day by day. So I, I think he's kind of making him play the waiting game. But I think he's also waiting for John. I I think he may be thinking that John might call him out with a giant win here. And I, who would be mad at John versus Stipe? I, I think John could easily skip the queue at heavyweight if Stipe and DC aren't going to fight, you know, in the near future. So I don't know. I, I think you're going to find out a lot this weekend after John fights. Um, I wanted to... Just touch briefly on um, so Dana White last week. I think it was at Super the Super Bowl Radio Row convert or confirmed that Usman and Masvidal will headline the International Fight Week card, and um, I think that kind of narrows down our Conor McGregor search for next the next Conor McGregor fight. Look, I uh, I absolutely love Usman against Masvidal. I think it's the perfect fight. Yeah. I think it's not only the perfect fight, I think it's one of the best fights in the welterweight division in probably five to six years. Um, there's but it's a right, it's a right, it's a right fight to make, right? Right there's now. There's legitimate heat. Everything. Yeah. Contrast to Styles, Masvidal is a bona fide superstar. I mean, that guy is for real. And I can't wait to see him fight. I think it's perfect. I, I think, you know, you do the Usman fight, and uh, if uh, if uh, Masvidal pulls it off, then first title defense in Miami with Yoel Romero in the co-main event. I think it's perfect. Um, and then as for Connor, the fight I want still intact, man. Connor versus Nate Diaz three, book the trilogy. He could do it in New York. You could do it in L.A. You could do it in Europe. You could do it in Vegas. You could do it in you know, on the moon for all I care. I'll find yeah. a way to watch that fight. Yeah, I think it's narrowed down now to Nate Diaz or Justin Gaethje, and they're both going to be at 170. I don't think Connor's cutting to 155 until he gets that rematch, whether it's, you know, Tony or Khabib. Um, yeah, so I, I love the Usman versus Masvidal fight. I think the build up to that is going to be awesome. Um, it's a chance, you know, to make Usman a big star now. Too, I mean, because Usman's got that African market. He's he hasn't been the most marketable guy, but he's a serious fighter. And if he's able to go in there and get a win against Masvidal, which is a big ask, um, yeah, I mean, he could be a big star. If and then if Masvidal gets through, then the possibilities are endless. Then I think Connor could go either direction, one seventy or one fifty five. I just don't think Connor's going to fight Usman. I, I don't see that happening. I don't see that as a fight he's going to pursue. So, um, yeah, I mean, do you think they book either Justin Gaethje or Nate Diaz around the time of that fight so all the timelines line up? I don't know what they're going to do because when you look at the pay-per-view schedule, if Connor's not going to fight in March, April, he's not going to book an actual fight is my guess because he wants to be the stand-in for the Tony Khabib uh, title fight. And then May, the pay per view is in Brazil, and I would be pretty surprised if they book Connor against Nate in Brazil. So no. now we're pushing although Connor June. has said he wants to fight in Brazil, right? He has said that. I, I mean, yeah. look, if they do that, like I'm all for it. I, I think it, I think it could be great, but I, I just don't see them doing it. So then we're pushing to June, and I, I just think that's a long time to wait, but. If that's the way the schedule shakes out, I'm down for Connor Nate in June, Usman Masvidal in July, and then look at, you know, if Connor can beat Nate, start looking at uh, him fighting for a title 
you know, around November MSG or December in Vegas. You don't think there's any way they put Connor on that card with Masvidal and Usman as a as the main event? Typically, Connor doesn't like to share uh, with any other yeah. champion because he shares the pay per view revenue, and he wants to prove how much of a draw he is, like just by himself. But I I don't think it's impossible, certainly. Hmm. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. But, I mean, fuck, we've got some good fights coming up. Um, Let me see. Did you watch the Rafael uh, Lovato Jr. thing on Rogan? Yeah, man. I actually did Rafael Lovato's uh, jiu-jitsu seminar last year. Um, So I got Mm -hmm. to meet him and, you know, spend three hours with him learning jiu-jitsu from a guy who's a multiple-time world champion, probably the most accomplished American black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, and then uh, he, you know, his fight against Gegard, I thought it was a close fight, but it was also a pretty convincing win, in my opinion, for Lovato. Mm-hmm. And it was really impressive to see that uh, a guy who's, you know, kind of a single-discipline martial artist his whole life learned Muay Thai, um, you know, went down to shoot the box in Brazil, uh, fought the killers down there and, and came up and, and really beat a guy in Musasi who's been a top 10, uh, middleweight for his entire career. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very sad to hear about, you know, his brain disease and, um, his struggles and, uh, I, I really, really hope that he gets the chance to to fight one more time if that's what he wants, and really just hoping that his health is okay because he's such a he's a great guy, he's a great role model for the sport, and uh, he's a really great fighter who has an interesting style that I don't think we get to see you know pure jujitsu guys translate all that often, and he's proved that it still works at the high levels of MMA. Yeah. No, that that was I totally agree with you. Um All right. Anything else? We leave anything out? I think that's it, man. I'm uh I'm pretty excited for this this card this weekend. I uh I always get antsy when we have the weekends off like we did. So, uh I'm excited to see Jones and Shevchenko and hopefully while there may not be many names on this card, I'm hoping that we get some bangers of fights and uh everybody goes home happy. Derek Lewis is knocking someone out, and then he's saying something ridiculous on the mic. I can just call it. So mark my words, everyone tune in to the opener. Derek Lewis is going to do some crazy shit. But episode 22, is that number 22? That's it, man, 22. Uh, Subscribe, rate, review, uh, follow us on social media. Uh, You know, uh, just look out for for all the stuff we're putting out on YouTube, on your favorite podcast app. you know, we're going to be we're going to be churning these guys out. So uh, everybody look forward to, to some more episodes. Till next time. Till Cheers next time, with my, my friend. Uh, with my rum. I had a little tropical day today. There so, you go, Park. Parker's Parker's MMA show. Episode 22 signing out. We'll be back next week to recap John Jones and probably watch some video. Of Derek Lewis doing some crazy shit. So till next time. See y'all. Thanks, Adios, Billy. my friend. All right. Thanks for listening to Parker's MMA show. Take a moment to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and visit Parker Keen's MMA show.podbean.com for additional information on Parker and to stay up to date on the latest drama in the fight world. For more information and important links about today's episode, check out the show notes.